We call it the midweek edition of the Morning Brief right here on Channels Television, Nigeria's Commercial Nerve Center, Lagos, is where we're broadcasting from right here. I'm Jeff Ruzam, and welcome. Welcome and welcome. Absolutely. Welcome. If you like, and give me the energy or keep the energy. I'm going to raise the energy. <laughs> ladies first. Well, Beautiful. Daddy, Jeffrey, I often mm. wondered why it's called Hump's Day, Wednesday. You know, Malpa usually refers to Wednesday as Hump's Day, and I often wondered, and I mm. checked, and, you know, it's a metaphoric reference to, uh, of Wednesday to a hill that you climb over during the midweek, and then you land uh, on the... Uh, final days of the week right. know, meaning that you have triumphed like uh, a plateau <laughs> yeah a plateau so so you go you triumph over whatever challenges oh. whatever odds are stacked against you good morning and welcome i am bukola koka guys i must say it's a very emotional day for me i am very emotional <laughs> why do i feel this is for the past few weeks <laughs> i have not slept and woken up to a cold morning the temperature <laughs> has been in the 30s but today <sighs> I woke up and it was cool. The temperature is cool. in the 20s. If I were in a religious setting, you know what I would say right now? <laughs> There'll probably be a chant of hallelujah. Goodness me. Welcome <laughs> to the cold side of things. It's been really hot the past few days. Mm -hmm. But this morning is different. So let's celebrate the little things. I'm Kyle Doki Kiyoli. So it has gotten to a point now where we celebrate cold and rain and all of that. Let me tell you how bad it was for me yesterday. So I had to open one of the windows upstairs. And then the drizzle, as it was landing on the uh, on uh, on the on the roof, right? Whatever was coming in from the window, I had to collect. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand what I, I had to just lay close to the bed by the window so that I'd just be feeling the water on my body. Literally, I'm water. saying whatever. Yes, the, you know the little <sighs> droplet that was landing on the roof. I like. Oh boy. Just bring it all in. You know, coming coming to America, that movie. Hello, my neighbors. <laughs> I'm enjoying this water. What's I wouldn't say what part? usually comes next after that greeting. <laughs> yeah. But no, really, it's it's yeah, exciting. It was good. Why am I different? You know, why why doesn't it make any difference to me? So Bukala, you do not stay where the masses stay. <laughs> you stay <laughs> you stay no, the, the in the highbrow is, area. The weather is pretty much the, the same. I mean, uh, because this morning when I woke up, I, I felt so cold I had to bath with hot water. <laughs> and I didn't want do you bath with hot, hot water every day? Not every day, but this morning because it was cold. It was so cold. So, Look, the so, director. So uh, I'm different. Our director said he, he he enjoyed it so much. He wanted to just continue sleeping and all of that. So how <laughs> well how, how was it for you? Uh, okay, so we are sharing our own experiences right here on the show. How uh, eventually uh, nature remembered us and brought us that beautiful rain and. Um, we had fun and we hope it continues tomorrow because the greed is still asleep. Oh yeah. Uh, so while the grip is in the grid sleepest, <laughs> let me use some, <laughs> some verses. Uh, let nature just be kind to us so that we can have a bit of fun and enjoy our sleep a little bit more because just sleeping in that heat is just quite unbearable. There's no light and they, well, I don't like to say that there's no light because of our Ghanaian audience, they just, you know, they will take it up from there, but I don't want to say See, that. Everybody has their everybody their knows share that of issues to okay. deal with right now. Maybe we also need to rethink the way we uh, erect our buildings. Mm. Maybe find better ways to build. Uh, because we know we're That's in a different point. region. I think we've known this forever, but we still find a way to build against or build in line with that well, instead of building in such a way that we are able to insulate ourselves from the heat there's better ventilation if you go to some buildings in lagos if a majority of buildings in lagos first there isn't much ventilation yeah there isn't much aeration so the windows are really tiny and the rooms mm -hmm. are very tiny exactly and then they build in such a way that i don't know if they you face the sun during the day <laughs> and then you back the moon at night so what, during the day you get all of the heat and guess what the concrete stores the heat, the roof stores the heat, and at night it dissipates it to you. Right. So it's, it, I think we need to actually start building in a creative manner. Do we need to change our materials if we need to? In, maybe. In house global warming. But, Hannah, but, but Jeffrey and Cardi, you know, hot or cold, um, we need to learn to adapt. We need, we need to be able to uh, up our adaptation, adaptation skills. And our systems, you, you know, have to also adapt with, you know, the weather conditions and every other thing. And I'm saying this, we shouldn't be uh, grateful because the weather has come and we do not have a, a, a dependable grid, you know, 
as a backup for how we live our lives. It should be the exception rather than the norm. And this is why I'm saying that you know uh, the past system should have been fixed such that Nigerians don't have to uh, be grateful. You know when uh, the weather changes brings cold and then we have some ease. Uh, we should be celebrating uh, on uninterrupted power supply as some African countries have already done years back before this time. You know, uh, that should really be the case. Uh, and I think this is the wrongest time to raise any conversation about removing any form of subsidy from any form of utility right now because you're going to make Nigerians really angry. Fix the system first and then let's see it work. And I'm hoping that one of these days we're going to have the Honorable Minister of Power uh, Mr. Delabu join us on the program and answer questions. Nigerians are asking a lot of questions. This grid is like it's in perpetual state of, is it falling down now? They call it in Nigeria. It's always, it's always falling. Like yeah. 13 times last year. This year, I think we recorded two or three two. times. Yeah. And in the uh, last it's, few it's, years, 46 it's, times. The Kaede was counting with those cards, and yeah. it was in, it's, 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 the truth is that it's quite embarrassing oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so for a country like Nigeria. We need about 40,000 megawatts to be able to do what we have. We have 13,000 installed generating capacity, uh, but we do just a third of that at max. Sometimes we go to three, we go to two, we we'll go to five, and then there was a time we went low, almost in hundreds and Goodness. all of that but it's really not nice but hey whatever the federal government can do we maintain that look no matter what the government is doing if you fix power and fix insecurity nigerians will take care of themselves we're very resilient we're very industrious we're very hard-working people but it's not just about combat we're just, not just about complaining we're also very grateful that nature remembered us <laughs> thank you Last nature night. We're Thank great. you. Come through for us again, yet again, but not with, not with the floods, by the way. We don't want the floods. Well, you can't just pick and <laughs> choose, you right. know. It, so come back, it comes back to the conversation about systems, to the, uh, you know, the point about systems. Mm. Our systems, too, should be built to prepare mm -hmm. for the flood. Our systems should be prepared, uh, built to prepare for the heat, for all sorts of weather. And for a country that is blessed with nature's essence as Nigeria, so whether it's solar, whether it's hydro, whether it's wind, we should be able to uh, boast of a dependable power system, you know, and our systems too should be able to uh, prepare for the floods such that, you know, uh, our communities are not ravaged by flood, by erosion, you know, so, and th that speaks to what Kadi was built, talking about how we build our homes as well. So what's the intervention, the ecological intervention for all of these issues? You know, something for the authorities to reflect on this morning. Absolutely. I remember my cousin, when he was in uh, university studying architecture, they call it uh, factors that influences architectural ideologies. So you right. look at your environment and build not just copy and paste. I remember if, if a federal government worker said, we like to copy and paste, but if you can't paste properly, don't even copy. Let's go to what we have for you today on the show. Now, the series of, of abductions arguably attests to the enterprise elements of the crime that has constantly embarrassed the Nigerian state and its security agencies. Citizens are fatigued and almost desensitized at the reoccurrence every other day, but we will continue to ask those very hard questions until we find the answers to this spate of insecurity and especially kidnappings. And one of such answers will be coming from our guest, who is a scholar at the Nigeria Defense Academy. And there's more. We continue to probe the rising debt profile of subnationals who, whose debt sustainability capacity continues to affect development despite the increased allocation from the Federation account. So what's the missing link, you know, really keeping some of them on the verge of fiscal precipice due to its inability to sufficiently and comfortably, comfortably meet her obligations? Oh, yes. But that's not all we have for you. As always, we give you something to just... Uh, get you relaxed from radio to comedy to acting to academics and still combining all of that in some way we follow the journey and evolution of Nigerian creative Helen Paul assessing her profile and prioritization as well as what young people can learn from being multifaceted there's a lot for you today on the show, as you can see our lineup on the program. And of course, don't forget, it's a community show and we like to engage with you just like you engage with us. So on X, we allow you and we ask you and appeal to you to go there, post your thoughts and your comments. 
CTV Morning Brief is where to go. And that's the number on WhatsApp. You can send your messages as well as your videos. Only do not call. Send them to us as we verify this information. We'll bring it out here to always amplify your voice because that's what the show is really all about. It's about you, 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 and you. Guys, so let's get ready. It's about time for it's us to switch back. gears now. Uh, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll bring you that, those top stories we've been tracking in the last 24 hours. Join us again. We'll be right back. On the brief this morning, things may have gone south and south, perhaps described the admission by the FCT minister in years on Wiki on his relationship with former Governor Peter Odile, whom he is referred to as a father in the past. He says at the moment their relationship is frosty due to what he considers political differences. Mr. Wiki at the media party also took a swipe at some River State People's Democratic Party leaders led by Dr. Abiy Sekibo, describing them as opportunists who cannot stand by their words. And that's in response to the group's call on the president to caution the minister. Let's get an excerpt of that conversation that also bothered on record high FCT budget, alleged land grabbing among other issues. The budget was just assented to yesterday by Mr. President. Okay. Um, frankly speaking, it is going to revolutionize infrastructure as far as the FCT is uh, concerned. Not only road networks, also may health in education. From what I read, what the assembly were saying, uh, comply with the law, comply with the agreement you had with them, with the president. If you comply with that, then you don't have any problem. So what is the problem? You don't have budget. Can you spend, can you make an expenditure? And people are like, look, you see, and the court set aside the budget. Now, what people didn't know, and they claim, and that's why I laugh at them. Even that matter, the Senate of Justice uh, in the hearing of that matter, the counsel for the governor withdrew all the processes filed against him in that matter. Withdrew all processes, in, in which case he did not defend the matter. The so-called boy then that said he was speaker was a party to the suit. He also, through his counsel, withdrew all processes. Okay, assuming do not consider. What are you going to appeal to do? What are you appealing on? You do not defend the matter. Who to a party to? The so-called speaker then who also withdraw his processes. And judgment was passed like an undefended list. And you're not going to appeal. Huh. And, and you don't tell, lawyers don't tell you truth. Now you go around again, instigating so many people to file action against the speaker and members of the house. With the governor? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, some say he is not even fighting uh, back. Uh, excuse not, me, not excuse me, please. Anybody. Please. Tell the tell ya 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 three months old baby that one. The budget was just as the Wiki Fubara political imbroglio is never ending. Let's see how that plays out eventually in the coming days. Now, let's move on to other stories. Be on red alert for any form of eventualities a charge by the Katsina State Government to security agencies given the security challenges in the state. That notice follows the release of 28 children abducted by bandits at Kasai local government area in Batsari. In, uh, in the meantime, the State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Dr. Nasiru Moa, Dan Musa says all hands must be on deck to frustrate the activities of bandits in the state. Government cannot uh, sit down and look at this uh, madness, you know. Uh, so we decided to, you know, train uh, the hard-to-reach communities. Uh, recently, we trained 70 communities on the way to fortify and defend uh, their, their communities. And alhamdulillah, positive results are coming out that in most uh, places that they, 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 they visited, 
they are, they are now being felt, being dealt with by the local communities. So we are going to continue, we will not stop. We will end up this madness of these uh, bandits, with these crimes to the society. We can't allow our society to be destroyed by these people. Let's also tell you that two students at the Federal University of Wakari in Taraba State are in abductors' captivity after they were kidnapped by gunmen. The armed abductors are said to have operated for about an hour, shooting sporadically and injuring many students in the process, with security operatives' intervention uh, coming quite late despite being located a few meters, few meters away from a checkpoint. Although the security operatives are yet to comment on the incident, a resident identified those abducted as Joshua Sedona from the Department of Economics and Obias, Obiano Elizabeth from Microbiology Department. The Minister of Education, Professor Taha Maman, says the government, uh, that's the federal government, is determined to build a reliable database for the sector and better coordination to reduce the number of out-of-school children in the country. During the maiden quarterly citizens and stakeholders engagement on Nigeria's education sector in Abuja, he also appealed to security agencies to rescue kidnapped school students in Calabar and to secure e-school environment for safe learning. The younger ones who can still go back to school uh, because they are still young, they brush them up and then uh, they are returned back to school. And the older ones who cannot go back to school, they will be reskilled, they will be given some skill and then empowered and proceed with their lives. How many schools do we have in Nigeria? Where are they? How close are they to each other? What is the condition of those schools? What is the infrastructure in those schools? We need to know right across. Only four days ago, in Calabar, three students were whisked away, kidnapped. Uh, very sad. We really hope and appeal. The security agencies are able to uh, uh, track and bring back these kids. And now to other stories, the President of the Senate, Senator Godswill Akbabi, is asking Nigerians to unite in the spirit of the Ramadan season in order to overcome the challenges bedeviling the nation while breaking fast with Muslim faithful in Abuja. Senator Akbabi said collaboration between Nigerians, irrespective of religious affiliation, will ensure the prosperity and security of the country. Coming together, facing with Deputy Senate President, is all that we need. We need to continue to work together as brothers and sisters of the same God, the Almighty God, for the benefit of our dear country. There is nothing, religion cannot divide us. No matter the turmoil, no matter the political disagreements in some instances, even families do disagree, but we must bear one thing in mind, that we are saving humanity. And we are serving humanity through Almighty God. Now, a farmer's home and his poultry farm went up in flames on Thursday when, uh, Tuesday rather, when angry youths in Nabo Guang community, known as Eto Baba of just North local government area of Plateau State, set it ablaze for alleged killing of his employee. Eyewitness accounts in the community told Channels Television that the incident occurred when a case of theft was reported at a poultry farm within the community, but rather than hand over the suspect, who is a security guard at the farm, to the security agents, the suspect was manhandled by the owners leading to his death. The angry youths in the community thereafter are said to have proceeded to the farm, housing about 5,000 birds, looted the chickens, as well as eggs, and destroyed the building. Intervention of security agencies also aggravated the situation when the community youth leader was hit by a tear gas canister, which led to the agitation, which led the agitated youth setting the house ablaze, and also two vehicles were also burnt. Around after three, we saw a car going down, so we had to block the car, not knowing that it was Wombudo's uh, son.
time. So we now ask him that what what is happening because we saw his father and his mother coming up. So we ask what is happening. He now said the they caught a thief and I said okay who is a thief he now said the security man that is securing the place so we now said okay let's come back so that we'll see the situation if we can take him to the station when we came we saw Mr. Wobodo and the wife and the son they have already dealt with the thief they broke his head broke his leg his hands they are swollen all so we now said why won't you okay you did a good job because you have already catch him right-handed why won't you just take him to the station I know if you take him to the station the station will tell you that go and treat him first so that case will start he refused he said till around six to seven he's going to take him I said we just came back from the station because we took a thief to the station too why won't you just take him he insisted that he's not going there then after six that was when they now wake me up from sleep because I entered the house around five they wake me up from sleep that this is what happened that the man is dead Quite unfortunate. Send to some cherry news. The wait is over as Dangote Petroleum Refinery has commenced the sale of automotive gas oil, popularly called diesel, to local oil marketers nationwide. Dangote Group executive confirmed the products have been evacuated by sea and road as local oil marketers agreed to pay 1,225 naira for the product according to the bulk purchase agreement. It can be recalled on January 12, 2024. The Dangote refinery announced that it had commenced the production of AGO, popularly called diesel, and aviation fuel, or jet A1. On the international scene, it's a new dawn for the Republic of Senegal. 40-year-old Vasiru Diomaye Fire has been sworn in as Senegal's youngest president after a 44-year-old, I should say, after a sweeping victory at the polls in March. The youthful population now look up to fire to walk the talk, just as he pledged radical reform 10 days after he was released from prison. The 44-year-old has never held an elected position, but several African leaders attended the ceremony in the new town of Diem, near Do, near the capital Dakar, including ECOWAS chairman and Nigeria's president, Bola Tinubu, where fire pledged to uphold the tenets of the West African nation's constitution. And out of sports, where the courts of arbitration for sports has thrown out an appeal from the International Boxing Association, that's IBA, after it was stripped of its right to organize boxing events at the Paris Olympics. The International Olympic Committee withdrew its recognition of boxing's governing body, the IBA, last year due to long-standing concerns over governing issues. In its ruling explaining the decision to dismiss the IBA appeal, the CAS panel says the organization has not increased its financial transparency and sustainability. Uh, process. And those are the stories we've been tracking for you in the last, say, 24 hours. It will also shape our conversation on the program as well as the rest of the day. Bukala now joins me as we'll take a look at what you've been saying uh, on X. Bukala, thank you yes, so well much. Jeffrey. Uh, so, you know, interesting lineup, but yep. one of the, the, the story, uh, stories that stands out is the inauguration of Senegal's president, Basiru Diomaye Fai, 44 year old, yep. uh, one of Africa's youngest so far. But you know, Africa has made history with young presidents uh, prior to this time at the beginning of uh, its history of uh, mm. self rule. You know, Nigeria had 37 year olds as presidents in its past, you know, but many years down the line, it's been a tough reproducing mm. young presidents. And our own president has shown support for uh, President, newly inaugurated President Diomaye Faye. And we have exactly. a video there. Uh, you know, our president is also the chairman uh, of, of ECOWAS. Of so, you know, it, it demonstrated support for the new president. And we have uh, President of Nigeria there and uh, the newly inaugurated president of Senegal, Basiru Diomaye Faye. So the young man, 44-year-old, the youngest to ever hold the highest office in the land, and that's the Republic of Senegal. And now let's see how things play out. Uh, he's been combining force with Usman Sonko, who is the opposition leader. President Bola Tinubu right there, congratulating him in the presence of other African leaders. So welcome on board. 
Let's see how this plays out for the West African nation. Let's see what relationship will come out of this. So the president with his team were in, Dhaka, in Senegal yesterday and um, just to welcome uh, Faye into that block of yeah. leadership and um, quite commendable where we hope to see more young people, even mm -hmm. younger people, uh, take on the mantle of leadership at this level. We've had a lot of older generation, you know, been in charge. We've had people in their 80s, 70s and all mm -hmm. of that. Uh, but let's see some fresh energy. Uh, we can't despise the wisdom of the old, but we cannot throw away the energy of the young. This is which is what is playing out right there in Senegal. Like you said, Nigeria started out with young leaders, mm -hmm. young leaders in their 30s, their including 30s. former president, as <clears throat> some are still alive. Uh, from from a military head of state. Heads of state mm -hmm. and all of that. So these were very young people, literally in their 30s, taking up the mantle of leadership at that particular level. So it's nothing new. It's just that in recent time, it looks like, you know, the space has been taken over by the older generation, the old guard. So it's time for the old guards to begin to give space. But our, our laws are now clear that as young as 35 and so, mm. you cannot vie for the highest office in the land, uh, 40 or so. So all of this is it's, it's, it's quite good to see that Dioma Efai is the president of Senegal at 44. And speaking of freshness, you know, Basir Dioma uh policies and promises resonated with the people of Senegal, you know, one of which is you know, the promised change in the currency of that country. So Senegal will be in the uh, eye of uh, you know, uh, critics for the next one or two years to mm. see how indeed the Omaifa is going to uh, make the, some of those promises a reality. So uh, what do we have? Yes, for uh, so the things you've been talking about on X, one of which is federal government announcing new gas price for electricity generating companies as a Genco vintage. You say, where I steal the complaint, say, be like, Person, they fast forward my meter units today. Them still want increase tariff. <laughs> <laughs> so what he's saying basically oh, is that, I can't still, that as it is already, he's paying so much for electricity, and uh, add this to it, it means uh, well, we don't know yet, but there might be an increase in the price of uh, electricity if. Uh, they have increased the price of gas. Yeah, I, I know that the, 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 the regulator talked about the new, they call it the MMBTU, you know, uh, it's a unit of measurement for all of these gas supplies, so for commercial and, of course, all of these uh, other gas forms. So I'm sure they have better explanation for all of it. Daforel, okay, Bukala, you have the next one. The next one is from Daforel Studio, who says, I don't understand this. There you have it. Increase upon the recent increase, not quite up to six months ago. Someone needs to explain this. And you know, Jeffrey, you said earlier on that we need to have the Minister of Power to come talk to us about some of the developments in the power sector. And uh, uh, Chisom says, tariff price, I want to be sure we're reading the right one, is going up and fuel price isn't smiling either. Nobody to buy gen with them, the power with water. More like <laughs> we may start thinking, rethinking technology in Nigeria since every other form of firing uh, energy sources uh, 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 is getting higher in terms of prices and all of that. And indeed, uh, some Lagosians have been uh, converting their generators to gas yes. um, in the last couple of years. Yeah, it started well, you know, a few that, months ago. Yeah, that's playing out. But and the gas, gas, now 12 points, the last time we bought 12.5 kg was 15,000. No, it's now 16,000. Oh boy. Yeah, it keeps going. <laughs> and you know, I think something we should buy the, for less than 3,000. You know, the federal government, through the Minister of uh, wow. per Oil, Gas, promised uh, just a few months ago that uh, they were working on bringing down the price of gas. So, where is uh, we're work in that I, area? And you know, Jeffrey, and this is just the time to ask. Where are the CNG buses promised by the administration at the beginning, at the onset of the President Bola Tinubu government? Well, the government is going to one year, so we're going to ask this question. Let's continue to take yeah. your thoughts. Uh, Fanzi OJ says, why is the prices of everything, everything going up whilst quality is going down? And in this electricity case, we aren't even seeing the light. It's just so appalling. Improve efficiency, quality before increasing prices. This is being insensitive, wicked, and selfish. <sighs> you know, sometimes... Uh, Strong words. Economics uh, knows no sentiments. Uh, their work is denominated in dollars. Their mm. operations are denominated in dollars. So they experience the pinch of everything that is happening as well. So um, inevitably, sometimes prices will go up without it presenting it as an excuse. There must be better management of that system. 
system. This last one is from Child Health Hero, who says, electricity that is not consistent. I hope the new development is accompanied with a plan to fix inconsistent electricity. So if they're increasing, they want better value for money. All right, let's take more trends. Now, Quara market on fire. We heard the incident of the market being gutted. And uh, Annie Young Bassi says, how many fire services even working in this country? I mean, every time I see fire outbreak, you barely see them uh, contending the fire, okay? Well, this one is from Jade Sola, who says, what's causing all these? With all the hardship in the country, making properties still they burn, well, properties still burning. Ayo DJ Niton says, millions gone in flames. This is really sad. Most states seem to lack proper provision to fight fire outbreaks as this one. Mfang Umo says, we need to take precautions to prevent fire outbreak in our marketplace. Not just in our marketplace, but in our homes, exactly. in our offices. Now there must be a safety culture and a safety structure. Now that the, the, the weather is quite hot. Ebu Wafo says, the spate of market inferno in recent times is both disturbing and alarming. I agree. Well, this next one is about the explosion that occurred at Ikeja Cantonment, and that's caused quite a scare, yeah, if you, you recall know, the uh, memory of, the that memory canton- of 2007 exactly. um, Ikeja uh, Cantonment explosion. That was on a larger scale, but this was really minimal, but it doesn't uh, you know, preclude us asking questions about what exactly happened. 2002, I beg your pardon. Uh, this first one is from Asha Warlord, who says, Ha! <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that speaks of the memory. Ikeja Cantonment, 2002, bomb blast. Should not happen again, no. It, Amen. It, it, it cannot happen. God forbid. Amen. Um, Abdullahi Adam says, Disaster preparedness is very vital in any situation. Uh, such explosion should not be allowed to cause havoc to the innocent citizens, burning of refuse or any other inflammable inflammable debris should be done under tight regulations this one is from richard olushego who says thank god no casualty but i advise immediate steps should be taken to detect and prevent any explosion in the future and we've been talking about safety you know when we uh, touched on the market fire in quarantine mm. what's the safety structure exactly. in the armory at ikeja and containment dio daramola says refuse burning turned explosion are there landmines there or they burned an a highly inflammable element uh, well that's a question they have to answer and uh, our next uh, your next talking point is about the uh, commencement of sale of diesel by Dangote refinery which was greeted with a lot of uh, joy from Nigerians and that reflects in much of what you're saying mm. but coated with skepticism uh, just as much and this first one is from Imarok who says I heartily congratulate Aliko Dangote and the entire Dangote refinery team for achieving this milestone. It's not a mean feat. We're witnessing history laced with years of hard work, sacrifice, sustained dedication, and finance to ensure this project comes to life. What will be history, what will be historical, is a reduction in the price of petroleum products, not just diesel. Well, they are saying from the NNPC, I'll see you himself, Melikera has mentioned that even if we have duplicity or multiplicity of refineries, all of our refineries working, doesn't necessarily mean prices will come down. It guarantees what they call energy security. security. So if there is war in anywhere else that we buy whatever from that has to do with our product, we are guaranteed a supply. Um, so the issue of price coming down is debatable and all of that because they still sell to down between dollars and all of that. He has gone to America to buy WTI. Um, well, let's not go there. But you know, Jeffrey, we shouldn't stop asking yes, questions we will. regardless. Yes, we will. We will. Because, because the importation we have element this. has been taken away and yeah. that shouldn't be uh, At least even a little if it's, cost even if it's a little. when you consider everything that goes into the determining determination of the price of petroleum products. Okay. You're no longer importing on the sea. You know, and the landing cost <clears> and the transportation cost has also been eliminated. So, you know, where is that... Uh, uh, savings, where is it going to? The How will it uh, impact on the pocket of Nigerians? The expert to answer that question, Akoman George King says, the only good news about this is the job opportunity for some citizens and hopefully a positive effect on Naira. But as for reduction in cost of diesel in Nigeria, we'll need to seek God's grace to intervene on Dangote's marketing strategies and products. And it's quite strategic. The man did not start with PMS. 
Mm, it started, started with, with diesel. With diesel for people that need it for industrial reason. Mm. And there's a promised sale of jet A1 fuel too in the coming days by Dangote Refinery. And that's exciting news. I'm telling you, the man has been strategic. Yeah. Diesel and jet A1. Jet A1 fuel. So premium prices first. Let me recoup. <laughs> because... $20 billion or so for that refinery, I got to make my and money that's back. And that's anagestic for the headache of uh, airline operators. But the question is, will it translate into reduction in the price of ticket fares for Nigerians, such that that middle class uh, will come back into uh, the, 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 the system and the structure of the country. All right, Bukola, you have the next one. This next one is from Al Akomojo King, I believe. And uh, he says... The only good news about this is no, the, I think it's the next one. Oh, the next I... one is OR manager who yeah. says, wow, that's quite a large minimum purchase requirement. It's interesting to see that Dangote is taking such a strong stance with their sales. It will be interesting to see how this affects the market for diesel in Nigeria and whether it will have any impact on prices. He's curious. Yeah, curious, sir. Uh, Alpha with loads of numbers. I can't call all the numbers, but let me read your thoughts. The government should be proactive so that marketers don't deprive Nigerians of the price gains to end users. So, uh, a lot of economists on the platform today. You know, <laughs> right. I, I like the fact that a lot of people are now understanding how these things work because when the citizens are quite enlightened, it helps all of us to have a better country. Um, that's why we must educate ourselves. And that's why it was worrying to see Ubek say, over 100,000 students. Okay, that's the Dangote refinery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that. Massive infrastructure there, uh, right there. Twenty billion dollars, I believe. About that amount, mm. uh, it came to be, and twenty billion dollars. So, one of the biggest around the world, and uh, we hope that this works out for everyone, so that the prices, as Bukola will advocate, comes down. Another industry we need to look at is Only cement Bukola. industry. Yes. <laughs> no, everyone. <laughs> yes, another industry is the cement industry. I believe Oligopoly is playing a bad one on us. We need more players in, in that, that space. space. Uh, so that we'll stop buying these things at very high prices because mm -hmm. there are just few players who are controlling that space. You know, and, and as Karade would uh, often ask, since we stopped importation of cement, how come you know that hasn't impacted significantly on operations in that space? You know, such that uh, we'll have significant reduction in the price of cement. So you know, that's also a very critical question. What, what, what's happening there? Uh, that we have to experience uh, the upswing in the price of cement, significant, you know, uh, from what it was before to what it is now. There was a time I considered the subject on the price of petroleum products or the price movement of uh, petroleum product affecting macroeconomic performance. So wh why I say that is that there are so many factors that affect these things that doesn't just happen immediately. So the variables include inflation, exchange rate, and all of these um, uh, macroeconomic indices and indicators. So sometimes because this exchange rate is, you know, fluctuating and we thank God that it's coming down as much as possible, all of this plays into uh, how things will be priced eventually. Uh, inflation numbers is standing at um, 31.7. The food inflation is 37, which some people say is way higher than that. Uh, in fact, unemployment now, they say it's 5.1. I really don't agree with that ILO standard thing. And we should go back to what we were before so we really see the true picture of what we're dealing with as a country but, but so that you know, policymakers can be better advised. You know, Jeffrey, the, the, the uh, commencement of sale of diesel is pleasant news also for the cement sector because mm, yeah. are, some of the operations are, are done with the use of diesel, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, let's hope that that impacts significantly, positively, yes. you know, on that sector. And we're expecting the commencement of the sale of petrol too, sometime PMS. in the year. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope that uh, the Dangote refinery will consider PMI. Let's hope that Port Harcourt uh, Kaduna. Kaduna and the ones Wari. in Delta uh, will all come on upstream and so that we can have as much abundance of petroleum product supply as possible. But that's all we can take on this particular segment. And of course, we'll switch gears now to talk about the issue of spate of kidnappings and insecurity in Nigeria in just a moment. Join us again. I just started carrying gunshots. Ah, gunshot like I stood up like then the girl said, ah, they are shooting gun, they won't you run? I said, like, this is a gun that we don't know where the thing is coming from. So 
again, then, then, then I started hearing the gunshot like close range. That's where I, I started running. So like when I ran away, like I, I even went to her house. So like to like calm our, uh, ourselves down. Then like before I, 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 I came back, I called one of my friends there. He has shop at Triple A. I called, I said, Francis, what is happening around our shop? He said, it's my shop. Who I, but, but, but when he had the gunshot, he locked himself inside his shop. Then I had, like, when I, I was about uh, standing up, he called me. I said, Nature, I have to come back to my shop. I said, I'm, 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 I'm already on my way. When I came here, I saw people gathering, like, plenty of people with some, uh, this Yambaka securities. Then, in fact, they already locked the, the shop. Then they told me that this is what happened, this is what happened. They took my staff and they took one of the, the, the staff. I said, yes, I, I've been calling their number and their number was uh, going, uh, 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 not connecting. So in fact, I thought that they took on the, the, two star, the, the, the two of my staff. Then my staff just ran away and called me and said that him is alive. That he, he ran away. When he had the, the gunshot, he just ran away. And that's, that's how, how uh, he escaped. You came to get Sachet water and all of a sudden we just heard gunshots and those people just came in there and started flogging us with their, those stick that they used to control their cattle. Started using it to flog us, so uh, <laughs> they were even dragging us that we should come out. <laughs> it was just God dude, that <laughs> I even escaped. I don't know how come. In the face of me even coming out, one even points gone on my head. But I don't just know, it was just God. Just had to escape through this way. Well, some of those who experienced that incident in Wakari Taraba State and well, survived, you might say, given their account, two people were kidnapped in that incident. And I mean, it's another one, too many really, just recovering from what happened in Kuriga, uh, the Delta situation. Thankfully, they were rescued. Uh, the one in Unical, the Unical students as well, that's, that's sticking out. And now this one, and you sort of just wonder, what is going on if, I mean, if you've not done that before, maybe now is the time to keep asking those right questions. And we have joining us on the show this morning, Adam Zabu, former assistant director, internal security, uh, that's Addis at the SSS, a fellow International Institute of Professional Security. He joins us virtually on the program uh, this morning. Uh, good morning, sir. Welcome to the Morning Brief. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning again. Well, it's good to have you. Uh, and I know we've had this conversation time uh, and again, and I understand that with the tearing, uh, we would have to make do with your um, audio. But speak to us, listening to those survivors, uh, the lady there saying that, uh, well, they came and they were hitting them with sticks that I used to herd the cattle. Um, you heard the young man also talking about uh, the kind of guns and ammunitions that they had. Uh, I mean, you're an intelligence person. Listening to them, what can you glean about who is responsible or who may be responsible for this? Because that's usually the first question. Who do you think may be responsible for this one? Well, thank you very much. I think um, the issue of who is responsible may not really be the issue. Uh, because um, you know, we are in a, in a war situation and anybody can act uh, a particular profile to commit crime. So I do not really want to think about who may be responsible. But what I am uh, interested in is the, the planning and execution of this uh, uh, search. I have said before that uh, in most times, if we think that there is a law in the commission of this particular crime, uh, particularly kidnapping or even terrorism as it were, we should know that uh, they are not just quiet, but rather they are planning to strike again. And this is what we have witnessed uh, over time. Like you talked about uh, uh, the Kuriga that have been, uh, you know, rescued, uh, Delta, uh, these uh, of Ukari and uh, some other places that we have witnessed. The issue is that um, a lot of um, uh, uh, criminal elements who are um, 
interested in this criminal activity have been bred over time. There are so many in our society and across board. Before now, we think it's only the headsmen. Before now, we think it's only people from the south-south, from where it started. But it is everywhere. Uh, you can imagine the quantum of kidnapping, the one that happened uh, in Delta, um, those uh, uh, pupils and uh, other places. So. We, 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 we are still lagging behind in our preparedness to deal with this situation. And I think we should, the earlier we do it, the better for us. Not just government security agencies preparing for situations like this, but the whole citizenry preparing uh, to, 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 to counter this situation. For, if only we believe that it can happen anywhere, anytime, any place. And, and I think that is where we should start from. So let's uh, maybe find out from you, given the rising or the series of these particular incidents of kidnapping, which we refer to as spate of kidnappings, what sort yeah. of option, what are the options left for citizens? You know, I know that I think a legislator, I think a senator also had proposed uh, people should be giving access to get license guns and all of that because no one would just sit at home or I'm driving from here to Benin or somewhere and just allow somebody pick me up just like that. So if the state is not capable of providing the level of security that is needed and everybody's in danger, some sort of, what is left for the citizens? Thank you very much for this question. I think sir, we have, we have uh, uh, answered this in the past, but I want to repeat it now. There are still so many things that have been left undone before we even get to the issue of the citizens carrying arms to protect themselves. We have been discussing about the state police. A lot of uh, open spaces that have not been uh, that have not been policed properly in our country still exist, and uh, there is almost a unanimous um, call over the years for state police. Why have we not taken advantage of that uh, option? And uh, I think the earlier we do it, the better. I am aware that why the National Assembly and even the government is ready, I learned that just few states are ready to 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 agree to the to the state police. I think the earlier they are convinced to do it, the better. That's number one. Number two, uh, we, we, uh, in our country, you are aware that we have um, uh, well-trained um, personnel who have served in various security services in this country, who also run security, who are security consultants, security and intelligence consultants, who run security organizations in this country and outside this country, and who up to now, there is no legislation that allows them to have uh, trained men that carry arms, you know, in carrying out their assignment. So I think these are options that we should take and then uh, mobilize um, effectively, if you if you ask me, our community policing is not effective. Our, you see that our civilian JTF are not properly organized. We need to do those things and put them together to deal with the situation before we can come to the larger uh, society of allowing the citizens to carry arms and protect themselves. Well, arming uh, citizens, you know, may be far flung when you consider uh, the administrative or bureaucratic factors that will uh, get Nigeria to that level. That's if it's not even yes. resisted at legislation level. But what is within our capacity currently would be deterrence on the response yeah. level. And um, that um, incident in Wukari Taraba stage, you know, really uh, yeah. does... Uh, something to the imagination when you consider the report that uh, there, there was no response from security agents despite checkpoints being you know nearby just a few meters to the place of the incident so the question would be why is our response time to such incidents still slow i mean uh, there's also the technology component you know of the nigeria police force by which one can respond to um you know emergency situations such as this so the question is why is our response time still still slow what are the factors uh contained cont therein that should be tackled thank you very much i'm, I'm very happy uh, uh, that you asked this question if we are going to respond to threats 
what are the things that you need before you can effectively respond? Now, response in this context will be from security agencies. What are those factors that are hindering them? You, are, you and I are aware of the low level of uh, personnel, capacity, I mean, that are available to our various security agencies. If you look at, uh, if you take one of the security agencies, let me take the police for instance. We, are, we have seen how under, understaffed they have been over the years. And so if they don't, a, a particular police station may not have more than uh, uh, 50 personnel that uh, are on routine duties, then how many are left to be on standby in case there is an emergency that they can effectively respond to? Then what is the level of um, uh, uh, logistics available to them? How many serviceable vehicles are around that are still to stand by in case of eventuality. If you ask me, and from what we have seen, they are not something that we can rely on that can make them to respond very quickly to situations like this. You mentioned technology. Up till now, our, our open spaces, particularly our forests, we have talked over the years about geolocation. I know that there are some security agencies that have them, but how I how, how know are they that they can uh, you know uh, monitor our open spaces that can that they, from which they can respond if there are threats if you ask me they are still inadequate so these are they are handicaps and the earlier we we, we work on them the better for us we, we we have said this before if you look at the various uh, the three tiers of government, up till now, mm. it's only the federal government that has a responsibility of funding statutorily. Because what the state governments or, or local governments, are, uh, the little support they give, they are just giving it. It's not because there is any law that is backing them up. And that's why when uh, a local government chairman renders any little assistance, for instance, to a DPO, he thinks he's doing him a favor. Whereas he's supposed to be some that is statutory that is statutory in their responsibility to security agencies these are some of the major i mean in, in numerous factors that are affecting our response capability and this we need to work on of course they are their motivation you still agree with me how how low page our security agencies are up to today and the earlier we work on them something that will give them confidence that if i am not there and uh, something that will take care of my family are there we need to work on all these things Absolutely. And it's important really to take a look at how to, uh, the kind of tactics we need, response time, technology, and the rest. Yeah. But it's still important for me, and I imagine for some other people, uh, to identify what it is we are dealing with. We have asked that, you know, government needs to put out the names of those who are corrupt, who those who have fleeced the country, those who are financing terrorism. We've even pushed it further, and it's good to see. For sexual offenders as well, because it's important to know who you are dealing with, what you're dealing with, as a way of consequence, as a way of understanding the nomenclature, and I mean, I think the purpose is really endless. So I come back to that question around what or who we are dealing with with because if we don't know what we're dealing with how do we know how to deal with it you have said this is a war situation so anybody uh, can disguise or uh, try to act a profile so speak to us about the possibilities here is it possible that people are trying to act a profile to what end is it possible again that these are just people who are who they act like they are in some sense and what we need to be doing about that Oh, thank you very much. I think uh, let us let us look at um, who we are dealing with. It depends on the but who you are dealing with. It depends on the particular operation that has taken place. For instance, if you are looking at uh, the kidnapping and the, the general insecurity uh, in, in Plateau, for instance, in uh, in Kaduna State, for instance, you will agree with me that you are dealing with people who want to take land from the original, I mean, the aborigines. Those are the people you are dealing with. And they are mostly headers. Those are the people you are dealing with in that area. If you are, if you are talking about, um, you are talking about uh, uh, the Northeast, you, you know that you are dealing with terrorists. 
terrorists that want to take a particular part of the country to rule it based on their own understanding, whether it's religious or economic base. Those are the people you are dealing with. If you are looking at uh, um, um, the Zamfara, Sokoto side up to Niger, you know that you are dealing with bandits who want to uh, use their um, uh, terror activities to acquire whatever they think they can acquire for themselves, for they believe that the society has cheated on them over the years. Okay, if you are, if you are in the Southeast, uh, you know that the people you are mostly dealing with are some persons that believe that they must control the, 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 the region, uh, the government of the region, and others that are there that also want to uh, get people kidnapped to make money for themselves. Those are the people that you are dealing with. So in a, in a particular situation, you don't have some particular individuals, but people that have um, a, a particular goal, they want to achieve by the by the uh, uh, kidnapping activity you know kidnapping is a tool in terrorism in insurgency in uh, in uh, in in um and banditry. It is uh, one of the uh, successful modules of Randy. And uh, you are aware, you, you saw one of the kidnappers of recent on the TikTok sleeping on how much he has taken from the people. Certainly, it's surely uh, for economic purpose. So, these are the people we are dealing with. But again, if you come to our country, I, I heard you mention a very, very germane thing corruption. Are we ready? to fight corruption in this country. If we are ready to fight corruption, are we ready to offer death penalty to people that are convicted of corruption? Even, even kidnapping itself, those that even kill during kidnapping that have been, that have been uh, convicted, how many of them have been executed? Let us look at our legal system of fighting cor corruption, kidnapping, and all the like in this country. Has it been effective? Don't we need to work on them? For me, I think we need to work on them. Someone said that uh, after God is government, and they were very deliberate in that statement, that if government is willing uh, to do what they need to do, uh, things will change. We've seen a situation where, because of the killing of 17 soldiers, the army have been operating and they've determined that they'll get the result they want to find the people, the suspect or the pe persons involved in that killing as well as the ammunition. We've also seen in the same scenario, or at around the same time, Nadim and Jawala Binance escaped from the custody of the NSA. So it's like mm. conflicting signal from the authorities as to the efficiency of the system. So in your assessment, I know you had worked with the DSS. Is the state doing enough to show that they are ready to protect the people? Thank you very much. I think, uh, I think uh, uh, let's look at the issue of, um, of um, the, office, the escape of the suspect from the office of the NSA. Uh, it's one of those um, things you find uh, in a system. Uh, some persons certainly must have derelicted either deliberately uh, or, or by mistake uh, in allowing that kind of uh, a first class suspect, I mean, suspect to escape. Uh, it uh, shows. Um, uh, incompetence of those officials that uh, the, the suspect was in their custody. I do not want to use that singular act to say that uh, uh, government uh, is not serious about, uh, you know, uh, carrying out its responsibility. But what I want to say is that uh, uh, government need to do more, particularly in this area of fighting um, uh, corruption in our country. Uh, we, are, we, are, we have seen um, various administrations come and go, and uh, there's hardly any any probe of a previous uh, administration. And uh, before you know it, they will go to court. Uh, even the few ones that uh, will be apprehended, they will go to court, they will use technicalities, and at the end of the day, they charge and have Quitted and all the looted funds are gone. And so we need to work on it. And government must show commitment. Of course, everything, uh, the, the example that must be laid for people to follow must come from the, 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 the leadership of, of the country. And we need to do that. 
And I think uh, the present government has a, a lesson to learn based on what the previous one did and what the complaints of the citizens are for us to, to move forward and be more pragmatic how we deal with the situation. Uh, the present government has said times with that number that nobody will be spared. And I think uh, if we take off corruption, the way the EFCC is going, it does not seem to be sparing anybody. And I think uh, it's left for judiciary now to comply, I mean, I mean uh, to work hard and ensure that technicalities don't free people anyhow. Indeed. Uh, I know the wife of the president had also uh, proposed well, death for kidnappers or those who are convicted yeah. of kidnapping. So well, all of that in the mix, uh, we'll see how it goes. But we'll stay on these issues. I would like to thank you so much uh, for providing insight into this very thorny matter. We've been speaking with Mr. Adam Zabu, former assistant director, internal security at the SSS. He's also a fellow, International Institute of Professional Security. Thank you so much for your time on the show. It's my pleasure, thank you. Well, we'll go to break now. And when we return, we talk about, well, the economy, finance, transparency and accountability when it comes to the use of public funds by government and hey by the people as well that's the moment stay with us Welcome back, Olua Dari Kolawale, the Deputy Director of Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project, Serap, as well as Governance Advocate and Human Rights Lawyer, joins us on the program as we talk about the economy with focus on the debt profile of states and the nation and uh, the loans they are obtaining, as well as uh, fiscal propriety. That's the conversation we will be having in the next few moments. Uh, Mr. Kolawale, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning, Jeffrey. I know that uh, Serap has been in court every other day, literally, to, you know, put government in check. I don't know how that has helped in really putting them in check. That's the conversation we're going to have at some point on the show. But the concern here is that the, our debt burden keeps increasing, and no thanks to the exchange rate. As, as it stands now, I think the last time we checked, uh, almost 80-something or so uh, trillion naira in domestic debt. When you add the ways and means that has accrued over 7 trillion, plus the 22 that was, or 23 that was originally collected. In terms of external, we're almost hitting 50 billion, and the, the numbers are not looking good, despite the fact that they are saying we're having accretion with FPI due to the reforms of the uh, central bank and all of that. But as a first take on in this conversation, isn't it disturbing that despite the removal of fuel subsidy and more money into the Federation account, which at some point got to 1.7 trillion, that was they disperse about 900 billion so that they will not will not have too much liquidity in the system governors are still going borrowing it's not uh, thank you very much jeffrey and i could see the way you are conversant with the figures just like every nigerian of how much nigeria owes but the question is do we know how these funds have been spent and it's not really surprising really that governors are borrowing the federal government including the president himself the head of the government has set that example which I think it is not good. So there are two issues here. The borrowing, as it were, and then the transparency and accountability mechanisms that support the borrowing, that justifies it, so to speak. So the governors are borrowing, but we do not see a reflection of that, either in capital projects or even in the social economic development of the people. And that is why this um, issue of transparency and accountability comes in. It is not enough to borrow. Nigeria has always made this argument that it is not about uh, it's the debt to GDP ratio is good. But much more importantly, how does that translate to the, day, to the uh, economics of everyday Nigerians? The governors are borrowing. The, press, the federal government is borrowing also. And, so, and then we cannot see how those funds are impacting on Nigerians because we know that funds have been borrowed, but we do not see, we do not know how those funds are spent. Unfortunately, Nigerians are, uh, they are the victims, even though ideally uh, Nigerians should be the beneficiaries. Well, uh, Jeffrey started up also by talking about fiscal propriety fiscal responsibility and during the last administration there were concerns from the Ministry of Finance about how the administration was breaching the Fiscal Responsibility Act with the Ways and Means uh, procurement. Now looking at the Fiscal Responsibility Act uh, itself, it, it, it sets requirements for the National Assembly 
to approve a set limit for not just the federal government but the subnationals as well on debt. But it seems as if um, uh, there is a continuous breach even by the state government if you consider how much loans have been secured now. The question is why do we have a fiscal responsibility commission if it has no power to bite? Yeah, thank you very much. The same reason why we have several laws, including judgments of courts, including from SERAP, that the government has simply refused to obey. And what the government does from time to time is the finance tax is amended more than any law in Nigeria every year to accommodate some of the fiscal policies of government. So the amendment of the Fiscal uh, Finance Act, uh, the, sorry, uh, the Finance Act every year also impacts on the Fiscal Responsibility Act. But much more importantly, even the provisions that the, 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 the gut rails in the Fiscal Responsibility Act that are amended, they are not simply adhered to. And that itself solved the problem. So, for example, there are provisions in the Fiscal Responsibility Act that mandates that any borrowing should be for social development. And there must be a cost-benefit analysis to ensure that if it is examined, uh, I will favor the people. And that is, that is not done. At least we've not seen the National Assembly do that whenever the executive puts uh, the uh, proposals to borrow for the National Assembly. The National Assembly doesn't even bother to have public hearings. And National Assembly, of course, has the power to do these things because it's a bill, as it were, to ask questions, to, to let Nigerians weigh in. And that is why laws like the Fiscal Responsibility Act is observed more in the breach uh, uh, than in observance. But again, that is not surprising. Impunity has gone on for far too long that it, it appears to be the norm. And when we find government, either officers or institutions do the right thing, you can see the Nigerians are always surprised. But again, we shouldn't be surprised that we're here. I think why we should be surprised is uh, why we are not doing more as a people to ensure that we hold government to account. So, so, so yeah, pardon me. So days now into that ultimatum uh, which you gave. So you're counting. We are okay. counting because okay. it's a one week ultimatum and um, I think it's important to follow these things up so that Nigerians are not taken for granted. It is no man's money. It is our money. So the one week ultimatum was given to uh, Nigeria's 36 state governors and the minister of the FCT to account for loan agreements and spending details of some 5.9 trillion naira and 4.6 billion dollars loan obtained by their state and the FCT. Surprise me, please. Have you gotten any feedback, any, oh, we acknowledge we're working on it. I need, I need some surprise. Coyote, I think the surprise will come from the, Fed, from the state governors. We are yet to get a response to the freedom of information request. Of course, we have seven days. Seven days to respond either to uh, give the information, to provide information requested for, seven days to either decline, uh, or seven days to transfer the request to another institution that would have such information. And those are the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. We are yet to get a response. What is in silence? Not, yes. Yes, unfortunately. But really, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm quite hopeful that we we'll get the responses, either before we end up in court, which really I'm not eager for us to go to court on this matter. Are you sure? I'm not really. Okay. You should trust me. Uh, this, this unfortunately shouldn't end up as another public interest lawsuit. But what we found is that whether they provide information, the information before the ultimatum, as actually provided by the Freedom of Information Act, or while we're in court, while the file processes, some of this information uh, that gets released, as it were. So we've seen cases where a public institution would uh, decline to give us information. And during the process of the lawsuits, uh, one or two of their lawyers will probably provide those information. And really so, I'm hopeful. And I really see no reason why a governor should not be eager. At least this should be an opportunity for them to showcase what they've done. Um, I see them buy slots on TV and on print to show what they've done. So these are an opportunity for the governors and even the FCT minister to show the people what they've done with those funds. I really see no reason why they shouldn't do that. Really, the FCT minister has over one trillion in his in a, <laughs> to Budget. spend in this fiscal year, and that's a lot of money. The question I want to follow up on what I had is that after the seven days, we've seen Serap take them to court, public interest, all of this. What happens? If you go to court, you get a judgment eventually in the favor of the public. What happens? Is it, is it, I know it's justiciable, but is it, how do you implement that judgment to make sure that they, they give account to the public? 
Uh, I think in this case, uh, evidence abounds, so we won't explain tire as they say on the streets. <laughs> um, and I really see no reason why we won't have judgment uh, in favor of Nigerians if we do go to court. But really, I don't think we'll go to court on this matter, at least not uh, to a certain, uh, for most of well, the why, why do you Why are you optimistic? Because like I said, I just really see no reason why they would not provide Four days down the line, nobody has spoken to you. No, no. Nobody has even honored anything you said to. There are 36 states and the FCT, 37. <laughs> 37. No one, in terms of percentage, zero. It's just, as even said, hey, they have we heard you. More, and we just finished Easter celebrations. Perhaps in the, in the spirit of Jesus, uh, Jesus is rising from the dead. Perhaps we'll see some bounce back from these public officers. But as to what transpires in court and what happens thereafter, it is always interesting to see the arguments put forward. Really, I wish we would have time to, to look at the analysis of some of the things that the, these public institutions put forward in, in their bid to defend We're here the to lack of you. transparency. But sometimes they go legalistic. But amongst, amidst all those conversations, in the courtroom, you can see a certain unwillingness, a lack of distrust to provide information. Uh, and really, which shouldn't be. But in this instance, Nigerians know how much loans these governors have gotten. And if we can see the present governor of Cardinal State mention this in public, perhaps for the present governors who did not take those loans, this would be the, the best time for them to say, hey, since I've come in, I've not taken a penny. I've not taken a couple. And this is what I've seen or I've not seen in all those sometimes. Even though some of them have taken up loans to, like you've seen from the analysis of the debt management office, that in the first six months of administration, and this has gone on for too long, this is not recent, in the first six months of every new administration, there's always an upsurge in loans, and then the last six months also, which I think is quite understandable. <laughs> new guys come in, like and they want to do some, some things, and then when they, they are exiting, of course, running up towards the elections, these things will happen. So these conversations about transparency and accountability, anti-corruption, and good governance, they are all linked. And again, it translates to the economy, unfortunately, it bounces back on Nigerians as the, the ultimate victims. But I see no reason why we won't have judgment, and I see no reason why this judgment will not be enforced uh, on behalf of the Nigerian people. You know, Kadia and Jeffrey's concerns are legitimate <laughs> because <laughs> Serap is seen as a professional sewer. And I, I'd also <laughs> like to ask how many cases you have in court against government. You know, but for me, uh, that will be on the periphery. I'd like to go back yet again to the concern about fiscal responsibility. And perhaps you can also educate us about what it says about uh, putting a limit on the borrowing appetite of the subnationals and the federal government. This takes us back to a few years down the line when the former uh, governor of Kaduna State was going to borrow and you know there were oppositions from members, lawmakers who were from his own state. So what is contained in the Fiscal Responsibility Act that prevents, uh, that, that puts a limit on the subnationals to borrow. And if we have 13 new governors who have borrowed to the tune of over 250 billion naira, that means that there, were no, there was no scrutiny from the National Assembly. Among the various provisions of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which is aimed at ensuring that agents of government, including the federal government, do not uh, pass certain thresholds, is the, the, GDP, uh, the, the GDP ratio per annually as to how much can be borrowed. But when you look at the trajectory over the years, these has always been breached by the federal government itself, by, in, by the ways and means. The Borari administration did that twice. We went to court. The matter is still in court as we speak. And so it is not surprising. If the federal government can do this, the states will follow suit. And don't forget, when the states borrow external debts, of course, the, the federal government is the, uh, is, is the guarantees that loan, uh, sort of. So it is not surprising. So the discussion should not be about what the states are doing. It's about the federal these laws. And about it. And don't forget the National Assembly plays a very important role in amending the Finance Act every year. It is at the state of amending the Finance Act that the National Assembly, as representatives of the people, should have asked these pertinent questions about either the mid-term or the long-term uh, uh, borrowing plans and to be able to provide that much in the checks and balances. But they don't. So Nigeria's problem has not, uh, is not a lack of laws. We have lots of them. They're very good laws as they are. But it is that when people, public institutions and public officers, get away with breaching these laws, then they, get, they, they simply get away with it. So by amending the Finance Act, it impacts on many laws, including the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and nullifies some of those sections that allows uh, government agencies, state governors in this instance, to do those things. But I think the, the angle we are looking at of transparency and accountability is that these laws have been breached that have allowed these uh, governors to borrow. 
What have they done with those funds? Let's start the conversation and perhaps work backwards to how they have break the laws. And like I told you, we have two cases in court presently against the Buhari administration for breaching the uh, provisions of the Fiscal Responsibility Act by use of ways and means, which is yet to, uh, to be determined. You know, one of the purposes of this conversation is also to equip people with the right information they can use in engaging governance. Right, so you have governance at different levels, and people need to take this up, not just it ended in the studio. So, speak to us what the possibilities are. If after the next three days you do not get uh, the information you need about the breakdown and all, which is accountability and transparency, what is what are the possibilities? Because obviously, if you had, if you don't want to expose something, it means something is happening behind the scenes. So, can we then look at those states and say, hmm, the money was diverted, was stolen? was misappropriated or something fishy so really happened. So, so many, many and I can go on and on. We have a lot of these things. So is that the possibility? Is that how we should begin to approach you know, these uh, people in government? Because obviously they didn't open their books for us to see. And I also like you to speak to how it is from your experience. Uh, we've seen, and I'm talking maybe governors, commissioners, civil servants, uh, stealing public funds. What are those ways, the ways and means <laughs> with which they do it? So again, people are aware and they can begin to look out for these things so we can work together and end this. Uh, uh, Kairi, you're giving me the job of the EFCC to try to give you insight as to how to do these things. I, I but, mean, I, as little as you can, let's empower people. So, but, but this is very important to the first part of your questions about the next step, as it were. These kind of, these conversations are important, which I think is very important platforms that your organization is providing. Your aim is for the citizens to take this up. Uh, Serap has written FY request this time. It's public knowledge and probably will end up in court. But much more importantly, from the president to the governors to the National Assembly to the State of Assemblies, they represent people, they have constituents that should take this up. Like we've seen with pension laws, the, people, the outcry has gotten so much that we started to see the change. Yeah, maybe a bit in trickles, but we've seen what happened in Abia State. We've seen what Lagos has said some years ago. We've seen what has happened in regards to pension laws. So the aim is for people to take this conversation, own this fight, so to speak, and to be able to make sure it translates to some level of transparency and accountability. And that is why the question that Serap is asking is very important much more than the issue of breaking the laws to borrow in the first place, like I've said earlier. It is about tracing how this funds have been spent. You've asked about how this stealing takes place. It's about the procurement process. If these funds have been borrowed legitimately or not, then the procurement process is how they spent. Who got the contract? Where are the, where are the locations of the contract? What is the uh, process? And who are the beneficiaries and all that? That is how these funds end up being stolen. Construction of a 20-kilometer road at uh, 30 billion air. Whereas if you look at it, it shouldn't cost a millionaire. That's how these things uh, end up in private pockets. Actually. So can we, pardon me, say that those who don't give us information have something to hide and we can classify them as suspected thieves? Yes, really, because really, and the thing is, the law mandates these public institutions to provide this information. Why did the debt management office put for details of how much Nigeria has borrowed? Each state is written there clearly, the domestic, the external loans. Then why can't we know what these ones have been used for, really? So at the end of the day, let's, let's, let's posit it as much as possible. Um, is Sarah thinking of changing strategy in approaching public accountability? I'll give you a classic example so you can speak to it. Delta State, December 2021, according to the DMO, their debt status was $154 billion. In one year, by the next December 2022, under the Okowa government, the debt has grown to $304 billion. And there's an, a state assembly. Does Serap look at these assemblies and say, besides these governors, these are the people that also should be held accountable because they are the ones that should bring that check and balance? I'm saying $150 billion was borrowed in one year. To do what <laughs> is the question? Maybe the governor can answer for himself or not. I'm just using that as an example, classic example. DMO has that record. I have it here. So is Serap thinking of changing strategy to beyond the governors of the state assembly? Because they are the ones that actually naturally are supposed to hold these people accountable. And yes, we do that, which is why, again, it's not only about against the government, the president, as it were. It's about all public institutions. Ultimately, the aim is for the people to take this up. We've been having this conversation and millions of people around the world are listening. I believe that after this conversation, they are better informed enough to take up this advocacy. The, the members of the state of assembly in Delta State, of course, they, they represent people. Who should 
should be able to ask these pertinent questions. Perhaps they do not know this figure that you have quoted. Now they know. And then they are able to take up this advocacy beyond the three issues that I think has always divided Nigerians, tribe, politics, and religion. So when the people understand the reason, the, the legal framework, that the governor owes them a duty to tell them, and they also have a right to ask, and then they'll take this up. And bit by bit, we build that critical mass that will end up uh, getting a change. Like I've mentioned, pointing to what has happened with the pension laws, I'm very optimistic that people owning the fight more and more will really uh, bring us good results in the short term and really in the medium term also. You know, and then uh, Harris' question about uh, deterrence is also instructive. Look at the Auditor General's report of just <laughs> February 2024. <laughs> 256 MDAs violated regulations spent over 284 billion naira without approval. So where is the EFCC in all of this? Why, why, why do these reports become normal? For us, uh, that's that's the issue, and that's why one of the asks that we put in the letter of request to all the governors and the FCC minister is for them to also invite the ICPC and the FCC, and we copy copy these two agencies in a letter in the FOI request also for them to monitor the spending. If they have nothing to hide, let these agencies do their job. And as part of the petitions and the various advocacy initiatives, we also get invited by the EFCC from time to time to speak to these things, uh, which includes uh, our advocacy on the Auditor General's report. Really, and that is why when you read your generous report, it, it creates a big picture of what happens through, at, at the MDAs. Your general puts it in black and white that these agencies simply cannot explain. And if you know what an auditor does, he simply looks at what has come in by way of inflows, he looks at the plan proposed expenditure, and he looks at any paper trail that shows that this fund has been spent. And this guy comes up to say, I can't see any paper or document that documents how these funds have been spent. And again, nothing gets done. And that is why we need to continue this conversation, really. We need to be optimistic about this. And you know, the thing is, for every Naira that is unaccounted for, when you aggregate it, that's probably a hospital that is not built, a road that is not constructed, a school. Maternal mortality on the rise. And you know, the list goes on and on. But I, I like to ask you this is a bit personal. Um, I was reading tweets about Serap of late, and this particular one says, I wish Serap was a more serious body. I like the idea, but no bite and implementation. <laughs> uh, that's from Maurice Monnier on X and this is like what you find across board. So do you feel sometimes that you're unfairly treated? Maybe <laughs> Nigerians put a lot on your on your shoulder. Sarah, don't just take them to court. You need to enforce this. Don't just enforce this. You need to ensure that these people cough out the monies. In fact you need to protest on our behalf. Do you feel like people maybe treat you unfairly and expect too much from Sarah? Perhaps I need therapy. <laughs> but I think that is why these conversations are also important to educate the people for them to know. Serap is a civil society organization and we've taken up uh, this as our duty to do these things that we do. Again, the aim is for the people to own it, so to understand it. What can you it. do and what can you not do? We can go to court. The same way every citizen can go to court. We can write to government by way of advisories, we can write petitions and complaints, and we can use every kind of legal mechanisms that we have and we can protect the rights of the people. But it's it stops there and we can have conversations like this in forbearance of our freedom of expression but we cannot we, we cannot take part in politics as it were so the aim is for people to understand that Serap has done its bit it is for the citizens who are now better informed to take up this advocacy process and like the, the person who said tweeted this I, I think that might be coming from a place of, of angst a, a, a seeming frustration. I do not think it meant, it meant, uh, it meant, but I think it meant well. He is probably frustrated. But we have decided that we, can, we cannot be pessimistic. Okay, we are not cynical. Can you bite? He wants you to bite. <laughs> <laughs> so how will the civil society organization bite? We are not the EFCC. We are not the ICPC. Uh, we can only go to court and open the court will side with us. And many times the court have sided with us. And that is why we continue to do this. Uh, so, so sometimes you feel that the, the states, whether it's the federal or the Subnationals are become immune to embarrassment because your whole idea is well, you're putting them out there to say account for this, account for that, cough out this, else we'll give you this ultimate. If you don't do this, we'll take legal action. I've read so many Serap, like thousands or hundreds of Serap uh, uh, information and threats of this and that or the other. Uh, does, like I had to say, it feels frustrating sometimes. But do you also perceive that government has now looked at Serap and every other uh, civil society organization and say, they will just talk and 
That's I don't, the best I don't think get. so. I don't think so. Again, I'll point to what has happened with the pension law in Abia <laughs> State. This advocacy works, not because Serap is doing it, but because citizens are taking this up. So why did the Abia State government pass the pension law? I do not think it's, it's political. It is because the people have spoken up for so long, and we are nearing that critical mass that just means that uh, we can't continue like this. So we, we will continue to do this, really. And I do not think that the government has become immune uh, through this kind of advocacy initiatives. And really, we do get some kind of informal feedbacks. We've had lawyers from government in court meet us on the corridors of the courtroom and say, hey, guys, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. <laughs> that has happened so, several times. And then we get back to court and they're defending their, um, their bosses, their uh, bosses as well. We'll keep dragging uh, them. I, I have a follow-up to that, but we're totally out of <laughs> we're time. We're totally out of time. Uh, because it's, it's, it's quite tiring to see that um, I, if you run a business, for instance, you will be a little bit more careful on how you spend your money because you know how hard it works. But I think because sometimes some government officials, this money is free money. That's the truth. You collect taxes, you don't do it. Government really doesn't do anything than to just make sure that they collect taxes and royalties and all of this. So this plenty of money. That's why we're saying sometimes maybe they are immune to embarrassment. No. This guy was, they'll just talk and nothing will happen. Oluwadari Kololi, Deputy Director of Serap and Governance Advocate and Human Rights Lawyer. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, guys. Oh, well, we'll continue to keep government on their toes. That's what the provision of the Constitution in Section 22 allows us to do, to hold them accountable. That's why we have the likes of Serap to also join in that campaign. Well, sweet guests, now we'll come back after this break to talk about the softer side of life. Ellen Paul is here to talk about it. Join us again. Welcome back to the Morning Brief. You know, Albert Einstein said, creativity is seeing what, the, what everyone sees, but thinking what others do not think. And that pretty much describes the life and journey of our next guest, Helen Paul. Helen Paul, academic, actor, um, comedian, MC. Welcome to the program. It's so Thank good you. to see you again, Helen. Good to see you. Thank you so much. <laughs> what happened to your baby voice? Baby voice is there. <laughs> the young child grew up, eh? Well, the baby voice is there because the one that gave me gives without re repentance. Okay. So it's still there, so I use it whenever I, I'm making money. Okay, I was hoping that, I was actually hoping you were going to respond to me with the baby voice. Really? But, but we'll, we'll you're not paying me for that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Yes. So from Tata uh, Fo to baby voice to Don Jazzy. Yeah. Alaja Donjazi, uh, Chief Kuleni, Chief Kuleni, the general merchandise. You know, that's why I call you the relentless creative. Thank you. But we'll talk about you know th those different aspects to your life. A lot of people have heard your journey, your your starting point. But I want us to, I want you to walk us through your journey, how you got here. Everything is online now. <laughs> 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 what aspects? Uh, well, you know you have. Is it the larger than you? Because you mentioned different characters. Okay. So, so your, which your, of the characters? Not the characters. Now we'll talk about the characters. Your personal so you story. Talk, the Helen Paul. Yeah, the Helen yeah. Paul story. Helen, Helen Paul is uh, a girl <laughs> <laughs> born, brought up in Fadi Yaba, Lagos. Uh, public primary school, public secondary school. I will call it public university, <laughs> but Fedra. When it gets to university level, you change the name to. When the punishment is getting higher, you brand. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's basically it. Uh, worked as a receptionist when Buki Koka, as we know you, we used to know you. You said Buki Koka show me more, yeah. So you started newscasting. Like 18 or Helen, 17 we're years. about you, not me. <laughs> Excuse me, not, uh, is that not why we are we're here? We're talking about you, not me. You were like 17, 18 years. Wow. Buki will wear the way act suit. <laughs> I was like, hello. The school of journalism, and stuff is like, ah, this girl is speaking. <laughs> so as a receptionist, I went to her and I was like, Buki, please come and teach me the way you speak. Wow. And Buki was like, it's simple. I like more Nico Wafa. I'm not saying she should. She still teach. does that, by the way. Yo, when Buki became my teacher, higher, 
pen to paper. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've looked for trouble this morning. <laughs> and you're <laughs> very <laughs> So I said, what aspect? You did not mention. So I will start from our own aspect. I, I said, your personal but journey. Please, 17 years old, you intimidated. You don't have to let English. everybody know that we go way back now. I, I talked about your personal story. <laughs> it's not, our personal not, story. Not our. Your own personal story. I asked what department. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, but you taught me. Mm. Yeah. You know? so as a receptionist, where people would think, oh, she's just a receptionist, she's just a young girl. I saw, I like things and I go for it. So I like, please teach. And Bouquet created time teaching me. Then I imitate Bouquet in times of stretches, the, the, the stretching of words. Uh, imitated uh, Shola, Shola Kosoko in times of tone, voice tone, imitated uh, Dotuan Rifalo in times of modulation. Right. So I'm someone that once I like something, I go for it. I don't need to come too close, but I'm very observant. Um, and I follow the scriptures that says, write the vision, make it plain, that men may see and run with. I didn't know I was going to go into any presentation at one point, but I like it, I admire it, and I'm going for it. I come, and I want to learn, and I will learn. The fact that we are set, I didn't let that get into me, not even just for, her, for everybody. So that has brought me to, the, to a point where people just feel that I got it, I just got the opportunities. No, I go. If you need to learn, come down mm -hmm. and learn, you know. Then it got to a point, the same friend, Buki Koka, called and said, why is it that everybody likes you? Likes you? I said, because you don't call people auntie and boda. <laughs> I call people auntie and boda. I said, but they are not your auntie. But is that real? I said, it's not necessarily real, but that's what they want. People want you to grease their ego. So I grease it so I can also get what I want. And in your foundation, you must understand what works for you. Mm -hmm. Sit down, get a pen and paper. What works for me? What is working for Buki? What is working for this person? So I grew up as a child that was rejected and I want to be accepted. So what do I need to do? So my foundation has really helped me today. Now, the speed you are going is I. What next? So when you get to that point, then you ask, Holy Spirit, I need direction. Then God speaks to you. Cool down. You don't necessarily have to do skits. You don't necessarily have to run. You don't necessarily have to, the scripture comes to you. I speak to your by a lot, though I'm from Edo State. It's the mercy and the grace of God that helps you become successful without any sweat. So I take it easy. I'm not following the crowd. Mm. Why? Because of my foundation. So how you start your journey really matters. So where are you coming from? <clears throat> where are you going mm. to? Where do you need to take a break? And that's where I am today. So we're going to be oscillating between your many parts because yes, you're multifaceted. So we're going to be oscillating between your many parts. And one of the places of interest, I'm sure to young people, uh, we described you as an actor, a comedian and academic mm -hmm. uh, and uh, none of this is easy it's quite challenging to carry all of this so we want to look at your prioritization how are you able to prioritize such that you are able to accomplish all of this and now you have a PhD and all of that because we want young people to learn from you I already mentioned something when you see something you like go for it but don't forget the process of learning I have mentors that are not into entertainment, but they're into academics. I like the way you speak, sir. I like the way you carry yourself, ma. Ma, what is the meaning of doctor? And you say you are not a medical doctor. Hmm. Ah, Helen, he's a PhD. What is a PhD, mommy? They tell you about it. How can I be like you? I like the way people honor you. Oh, it's simple. Your field is what you should go after. So sometimes you need a mentor who can open up, not a mentor that you admire. Sorry for what that. What does that even mean? Oh my God, you don't Most people have 
Maybe you don't ask them. Oh, God. <laughs> Are we going to survive this sex? No, you will. <laughs> what I mean is truthfulness. The people that you're learning from really matter. Um, I asked it. I liked the, the person. But there was a time she told me, you this girl, you are too talented. Instead of you looking this way, come back and face this way. I was like, mommy, I don't want to be known as a comedian. She said, but that's what God has given to you. When we put you on stage for tragic scenes, you will turn it into comedy. <laughs> when we say cry like a widow, when your time comes and you are crying, everybody will be laughing. <laughs> you know? They're like, oh, really? It's like, yes, you can pursue that path. In person of Professor Osita is in Wani Bay. I want to say a big thank you to you and Professor Felix and Morua. They, they made me follow that path, even for my undergraduates. Then uh, Dr. Otsu Rashid, now University of Kentucky, Louisville. He looked at me and said, what is this topic you are writing? I wanted to write on feminism. He said, that's not your strength, Helen. Your strength is comedy. Why not learn comedy? Styles of comedy, techniques of comedy, history of comedy, and become an authority in that field. Then you have your PhD in that cell. I'm like, how? I said, come, you're doing theater art. And this man picked me up every Sunday. Would teach me history of comedy from Greek period to the Roman period to the medieval period. So I got interested. Now the three of them on only one girl. Mm. Why? Because I went and I was ready to submit to learn. Then in times of being a comedian, you have people who would say, this girl, you are funny, let's give you an opportunity. They are seeing what you are not seeing. And the first time, second time you tried, something is working. At that point, drop all your ego and your bags, learn. The same thing to a bookish show anymore, Shola Kosoko. You have a baby voice. This thing can work. I remember Buki saying, this is, a, this is a gift, Helen. Oh, Mokotoni, oh, Mokotoni, you have a gift. I'm like, really? Then I think we were 17 or 18. I'm like, really? No, we were about 20 at the time. Mm -hmm. At 20, yeah? Uh -huh. so I knew you were very out. small. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So inspired. And the next, <laughs> oh, early 20s. Early 20s. We're in our early 20s. Buki, we started at B18, 19. That we moved well love to mind. I'm older than you, too. <laughs> you know? So, Opportunities will come, and I remember a very uh, a big one that came. As a receptionist on my table, earning 9,500, a company came, they already employed Buki, they already employed somebody else, and they said, we need a child. The child that was to come was writing exam or something. Then Buki said, Helen can we imitate this voice. Shalak was of course said, yes, try her. Are you a fit? Don't worry, let's get her. Helen, can you imitate your voice? I said, why not? You buy me mineras. <laughs> and they said, why? Why well, we'll buy you mineras? Just come in. So I went in and I took the script. Mommy, what are you saying? Why did you? So as I was doing yeah, that, it's back. <laughs> <laughs> as I was doing that, the man was like, oh, you got the baby. I said, no, let her finish. She'll come out from the boot now, because the boot was dark. So I was just, the light was on my script. I was like, so I read. Mommy, I want picnic. If it's not picnic, I will not take it. <laughs> you know? So I did. Coming out, I was given a paper to sign. I didn't look at it. I just looked at how you are different. And I said, just sign it. <laughs> then they gave me a check. I think it was 350 before 50. I can't remember. Naira? My brother. I sat there good. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, when you say you are looking for another dream to be a lawyer or something. It was 1,000 Naira. 400 and something thousand was our money. And that was at that time? I'm talking about that time. Wow. Do you understand? So 
I will always tell people, I have the gift of men. Mm. I didn't just start. So who are the people that you are around? Who are the people God has placed around you? And it's quite instructive. You. you don't just have the gift of men. You have the gift of uh, acknowledging those men. You've mentioned at least six, seven names. <laughs> if I'm, if right I'm saying my story, I cannot say my story without, without mentioning people. people. Not and just those people, people, right. chains. You people. should maybe write a book, we'll talk about your book. You should write a book, just names of those people <laughs> and what, what they did in your life. Because I, I think it tells a story to people like that you don't you know. Crossing, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, you might get cramped, so you need to drop. No, we'll be doing time. it together. Exactly, all time. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think it tells people that you, you don't know who that person will become tomorrow, mm -hmm. that person that you're probably uh, looking down on, mm -hmm. the, the receptionist, mm -hmm. the cleaner. So you need to actually pay attention to people and do what you can to help them. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is not about your past, because I know you have a very rich past, and as you said, it's online. So <laughs> let's talk about your now and your future. You've done radio, you've done acting, you've done comedy, academics now. And Bukola still sees you as that relentless creative. Cre creative. So what is the future for Helen Paul? What is what more do you want to really achieve in this life? Let me just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> the plans of God. I cast my cares, knowing that his plans is of good and not of evil, to bring me to an expected end. It's good to write your vision, but sometimes you still cast your cares. That's okay. I want to be flexible. What next do you want me to do? So I'm in that position of what next? I like what this person is doing, but if the spirit is saying no, then it's no. I don't know if you understand. So I'm that kind of person. So are, are you in that place I'm now? I'm spontaneous. Right, you're, you're thinking, what more can I do? I have done a lot. I have are never thought place? of what more. I am just there. It will happen. The one who behind me as a spontaneous person, so I'm ready. The same spirit I went to in, carried me into marriage. She would have me, sure you like me. You like me. So yeah. Let's do. Let's, yeah, like let's run things. Let's, let's run things. But we disrespect you. <laughs> and if, of course, somebody was um, fighting the wife and no, my wife at least should behave like you. I said, your wife cannot behave like me because you are not giving your wife the chance to behave like me. I said, why? I said, can you tell your wife to do something and she tells you, I am not interested in doing it and you will let her be. Without doing, I am the head of the house. So what my husband is allowing me to do, can you also do it to your spouse? You admire something that you cannot even do. So I am free. And I'm all, like my husband will say, oh, she's a sports girl. I'm like, sweetheart, why do you allow me? He said, when a woman is in love, she has a tendency to be sports. It's just a child who you take out. If the child gets to the party, don't leave here, yes. But once you turn, sees other kids playing, if all you know, you will join the kids. But when it's time for you to go, I said, well, Junior, I'm going. The child runs and pick up without you having to force the child and say, let's go home. So it's the same thing with our lives. Understand what works for you and do what works for you. For me, I am very spontaneous. I am always saying something in Yoruba, maybe because I grew up with my great grandmother. So I don't think like, every other person. Eleda, Kilo to Dilini. What's this again today? I need something to work. We see your colleagues going to politics. Is that in the, in the direction for you or something? Sincerely, I have not thought of that yet. Because the position I would like to maintain in politics, they might not want to give me that Which position. is? The president I, himself. Which president? <laughs> Who am I? I don't like high position. It's just like you try to make me head girl of your school. I like food prefect. I can't trust it. I'll be fine. <laughs> but they didn't make me the head prefect. So I, I, you can't make me head prefect. Just let me be. Mm. Be at peace. I'm at peace. Live and let's live. That's my life. So if I'm going to be a politician, I might probably be, uh, maybe, let's think of it. 
agriculture. Oh, what a place they won't really look at. <laughs> Where you can have peace, right? <laughs> you know, I like INEC. Mm. And that's why I admire <laughs> Lequashaw's bossy. She's a lawyer in INEC. And she's a comedian. But what you are doing, you can't be a local government chairman. I still want to be a comedian. They will say you are, they will be stressing you. You are not working. You are not in your office when they see you in parties. But the comedian is the president of Ukraine. You see what is happening in Ukraine now? Okay, there you go. <laughs> Do you see what is happening in Ukraine? Well, so when the president takes things, we are fighting this other Russia country. They will tip is a joke till the fight will happen. <laughs> so I don't like that kind of thing. All right, Helen, you know, I started out by listing out many of the things that you are, you know, of but course. there are a number of things that I didn't add to that. Um, you've even done a single sometime mm -hmm. back in mm -hmm. the past. I so think, you're a singer yeah. as well. Um, you, you owned a school before yes. you jackpot. I didn't jackpot. You're going to tell us about jackpot. No, I didn't jackpot. Do you know the definition of the word jackpot? So you're a provost if your school is still run, running. Mm -hmm. you're, you're a provost, you're an academic, um, and you just recently wrote a book and you're lecturing in the United States, you keep evolving. And that's a huge lesson, you know, that we must learn from creatives like you. Tell us how you keep evolving. You keep, you know, turning, um, bringing different sides to yourself, you know, and how we can glean from that. Well, I am not one that would want to give a packaging answer. I like to give a sincere answer. Uh, I will still go back to the circle of the chains of people that I have. So you have uh, someone like the former Vice Chancellor, University of Lagos, Professor Duro Emi, calling you to say, so Helen, what's happening? Have you done any publishing in four months? No, sir. Ah, why? What was happening to you? I'm sending you four seminars where you should at least, I have somebody who wants to write on art. Join the person, you guys who, I think he has written something. You add up yours. Let's pub. So before you know, you are seeing Helen as a pub, like a published book. So like, ah, what time does she have? They will not allow you rest. Yeah, just like your mom, like my mom. Of course, you know, Mama. I say, ah, mommy, Helen. You know, she said, mommy, are you not happy that? Well, the the first. My mother even would say, Salawa Beniti Shea. Like, why are you comparing me with all the other people? You know, so people that make you feel like you have not even gotten to the place where you are dancing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so when, they, when you have people like that, it's different from when you have people that say, You have done it, you are there, in fact, you are complete, so you rest. I have people who make me feel like, eh, hey, so there's another space here. Right. Do you mean you relocated? You are who is relocating? Um, this school needs you. Can um, they call public administration of Nigeria? They need you. So, like, how? They need you. They need a freelance public admin person. So, I've submitted your name. Go for the interview. Find your way. Sir, I'm in America. Uh, let's see what we can do. Is the ticket not selling? <laughs> <laughs> they are ready to push you. Buy tickets. Professor Uche. Uh, of the Chartered Institute of Public Administration, will tell you there is an exam, and I need you in school to lecture for one month straight. You know, and they bring me back to Nigeria. One lesson that we have learned from you today is that you have fantastic people around you. We all have fantastic people. Encouraging you. We all have fantastic people, but we do not know how to manage them. And let me just say that uh, your book, Legacy of Debt, uh, is out. It's, it's, it's a story, right? It's like yes. a novel. Yes, it's, it's a novel. Of sorts. Yes, so it's quite so different it's from, on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, Legacy of Debt. And just to put it on record, you said you've not jackpot. I have not jackpot. Because you said Nigeria is a great nation, but how would we be great when our greats are jackpot? No, they didn't jackpot. It was some leaders that said not too young to run. When I heard that, I was scared, so I ran. <laughs> <laughs> we got to run now. Speaking of running, we really must run now. Helen, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We didn't know the time Dr. I got Dr. Helen much. Paul, <laughs> academic, actor, singer, writer. Ah, the list is endless. We look forward to having you again thank you. on the program. When thank next you. you come back to Nigeria. Thank you. <laughs> um,
That's our show for today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back again tomorrow. I am Bukola Koka. Absolutely. So tomorrow is another edition of the program. Thank you for your time and company. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. We hope we've been able to inspire you to acquire and aspire to be Maguire, whatever that thing is. But <laughs> Helen Paul's story is very inspiring. So hey, take a cue from that and carry it.